أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. The scope of the problem is too much to be covered in a short period of time. But just some general comments. In my experience, the sex abuse cases are many more seen in the girls. There are all kinds of reasons which can take a whole topic to discuss as to why. But that is the fact that we have to deal with. And the children who are abused, uh, physical, sexual, emotional, they are very reluctant to talk about it. And in some parts of the world, people may not be even aware of the way we are aware in US about the abuse. They may consider that still that they are disciplining. There are some statistics like by age 18, some way or the other, a girl may be assaulted. It doesn't have to be actual sexual abuse in the sense of being raped, which is the worst scenario, but it could be um, the comments made which really hurt her and that she had a hard time dealing for a long time, which were sexual in nature. Then one in seven children at one point or the other, they are abused. If I can expand this idea of child abuse, I can even say uh, the recently recognized um, term uh, bullying in the school, which is becoming more of uh, an issue, uh, and I'm glad that it is being appropriately addressed in most of the states. I'm sure uh, that uh, you know some children who have been abused or who could use some help that way. And it is something that we cannot ignore in our community. The, I wanted to talk a little bit about the family structure. The, the very definition of family and marriage, we know how in last couple of decades is being challenged every day in our society, in our community, in this country. I don't have to give you all the details how in different states they are accepting same-sex marriages. Before the industrial era, going back to more than 100 years, extended family was the commonest way of family structure, meaning generations will live together in the same house. People were more informing they would live on the farms, and even when the cities started coming into existence, the idea of extended family continued. Then, when the industrial era started, more and more people got into what is now called technically as nuclear, uh, we can say biological family, which basically means a mother, father, and a children. And as that happened, and urbanization started taking place, the family support started going down. Now you could not turn to this in the, within the same house or next door and if you needed help, ask someone. That's where all this idea of the daycare centers and things like that started and it also obviously had its own challenges and problems which can also lead to some abuse issues. Step family. I deal with them all the, every day. This is a couple of children coming to another family and they are the stepchildren. Then the blended family, which I say, my children, your children, our children. That's the blended family. So the wife brought a couple of them, husband brought, and now they have a couple of them. I have seen some families women going out of the way, sometimes even having special treatment by a uh, fertility specialist because they are now older, they cannot have children or difficult to have difficulty, so they are going to special places because they want to prove to this husband that I can have a child or two with you too. But it creates its own challenges that who's favoring who, at least the children that I deal with, they feel in a way emotionally or verbally abused and they tell me how they feel that this woman who is their stepmom is not treating them the same way as she's treating the other children. Then the foster family. 
This is an issue which is being discussed in the Muslim communities all over the country. I have been to many conferences. They are saying that many Muslim children where it is necessary and the state takes over, they are placed in foster home and those foster homes, they are not Muslims. And there are situations which have been reported where these children were forced to eat pork. So it is a challenge for us that we develop our own foster homes where, if needed, those children can be taken care of properly. That reminds me, last, uh, actually, this January when myself and my wife were attending a conference uh, in Riyadh and then we went for Umrah, in that conference, this uh, scholar from Malaysia was talking about Islamization of hospitals. And the people sitting with us in the table from Saudi Arabia, the doctors, they were saying, what is that? I felt, well, being in Saudi Arabia, they're the ones who should know it first. But what it is, in Malaysia and now in Indonesia, it started from Jordan. There are hospitals where they respect that the patient's Islamic rights should be maintained, meaning as soon as the a patient goes to the hospital, they are told that five times a day you will hear the azan in the hospital. Your doctor will go for prayer. There is a mosque here. And if you cannot do wadu, there are nurses who will tell you how to perform tayammum. So then you have obviously adopted families and other arrangements, mix of people, living uh, friends and whoever uh, together. They all you can very well imagine, they can create their own issue. Common issue that I see with adopted families is, it is not uncommon for an adopted family to have their own child once they have a couple of adopted children. The definition of child abuse, I was looking uh, for what could be the best uh, definition. It's hard to really describe. It can be legal, it can be that particular state, it can be federal. And then I raised this question myself that everything that makes a child uncomfortable, is this abuse? The answer is very clearly no. As you are raising children, you are telling them not to do this, stay away from this. This is cat or dog or this is fire. Don't come too close. Child will become uncomfortable. At times, the children will even cry or you will tell them, you cannot have this right now. You can't have the dessert before the dinner. They will become uncomfortable. That is not abuse. Then, so younger a child, we are doing disciplining. We are telling them the guidelines, the hudud, where things start and where they stop, where they should be. Then we get into, when they go get a little older, then we disip, start disciplining them. Like in our hospital, we use this. If a child is six, seven years old, six years old, six minutes in the quiet area. Eight year old, eight minutes. Not a bad idea at all. I don't particularly like when parents tell the child, you go upstairs in your room. Most kids who come to me, they tell me they don't do the best things when they are there. And they are also very angry and anger towards the parents and it keeps boiling. So it should be done in a very nice constructive way. Uh, then comes the, when you cross those lines is the abuse. In the Eastern world, and I'll say those words first, they say when you discipline your child, hosh se karo, josh se nahi. Hosh means you are properly thinking and calm. You have a purpose. Josh means you are yourself upset and angry and emotional. In that state of mind, if a child sees you, the child already has that level of anxiety inside. When the child sees that the adult who is trying to guide him is also out of control, the child is already out of control. It becomes too much, overwhelming for the child to deal with that. So never ever even discipline your child with that tone of voice. Okay, 
these are you will see most of these things are very common sense that you may have heard read but this is just to have a platform for discussion that these are the common things that we see physical abuse meaning child being beaten like this child is being yelled at in this picture sexual abuse of all different kinds and again those families that i described other than the nuclear family the chances of abuse increases then verbal or emotional abuse and then the neglect being in the hospital end we deal with those things too where a child is not being properly kept some children come to us they are smelling bad they have torn clothes and they tell us that they don't get breakfast and then medical neglect a child may have asthma child may have diabetes and the family is not giving them proper medications at times it gets to the point where the step uh, the state steps in and takes the children away so that they can be properly taken care of and the last one is the abandonment it can be of all different levels and degrees there are children i have dealt with i am still dealing with from very high functioning families i recently dealt with a teenager and he was acting out all over the place he was with us for quite some time and towards the end when i said today you are leaving what did you learn he said what i learned was all this which i was doing was just to get my mom's attention and this kid was arrested for doing stuff and then he realized and he said no i am going to turn around i am going to pay attention to my school brilliant child and i am also going to do some work my dad told me that he can help me learn things so that is a very clear neglect in a family of two professionals but more common that we deal with is that mother may be into drugs she may be going with her boyfriend and the child is at home not taken care of or several children and they are at their own and anything can happen while the children are there okay i i, I mean it's a very busy and difficult medical picture but i just wanted this word to be heard the common word shaken baby syndrome what happens is that a mother may be going through what we call as postpartum depression that after the child birth there are um, some mothers become very depressed and she cannot take care of the child or a boyfriend whose attention who's not getting the attention now or a husband who's not getting the attention from the wife and the child wakes up obviously in the middle of night several times and out of frustration he shakes the little baby and baby's brain the way it is situated under the skull is such that very easily damage can occur and there can be hematoma or the collection of the blood from when the blood vessels start leaking out uh, i have dealt with few of those cases uh, unfortunately over the years okay now these are the worst uh, cases of child abuse uh, i have been somehow involved one way or the other in all of them bruises is in that category very common and then burns mostly with the cigarettes or uh, fractures uh, and then ultimately obviously the death um when we call the state quite often if we are calling about some sort of verbal emotional abuse unfortunately uh, the states are not willing to come out and do anything they are overloaded systems and their response usually is does the child have a bruise and only then they move but there are many other layers and categories of uh, the abuse um and i deal with that system meaning the child protective services all the time and it is a frustrating experience to deal with them because their resources are very limited and they are only uh, running towards more crisis situations 
Okay, this is how I see children getting affected by different kinds of abuses. The first one I put as damaged self-esteem. That's what we commonly deal with when children come to our offices or in hospitals, that these children, they really need someone to support them to feel that they count because they have been yelled at, they have been screamed at, things have been thrown at them, they have been repeatedly told, you are not going to matter anything, you are not going to become anything good, you are, going, you are stupid and you will remain stupid. Those are the kind of messages that they, they receive. And the effect is that their minds are preoccupied with all this, yelling, screaming and everything else, and what they see, the spousal relationship, the domestic violence that they are witness of. Everything is on their mind when they come to us, they are surprised. First, they are suspicious that we really want to hear them, we really want to listen to them. Gradually, they start talking, they start opening up. Some of them start crying. And that's when we hear those things, that their school performance, I will ask them. You know, I know that uh, in second grade, you had all A's. What is it now? You're getting D's. And those are the kind of things that I hear that how dad comes home and he's already drunk and he wakes us up. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's yelling, screaming, using profanity. And so their school performance starts suffering. So then they, like you see this child, sad, and they start having problems in school. They start arguing with their teachers. They start fighting with other kids. They don't want to study and they run around in the school or run out of the building and all kinds of acting out behaviors, uh, taking away some other children's uh, possessions and also sometimes if they are getting depressed, their appetite starts suffering and we have a sad child here. Sadness is also pretty common and every now and then we ourselves may pick up some bruises on a child who has come to our attention, particularly in the hospital. When I say hospital, I want to clarify, uh, I, I'm not working for a medical surgical hospital. I work for a freestanding psychiatric hospital where children come who have uh, psychiatric, mental, psychological issues. So we may, so it is not uncommon for those parents, uh, the children who are coming from the uh, domestic violence, spousal uh, issues, and they are being also abused when the wife is being abused the ch and the child is being abused. They try to put this on someone else. And then hospitals like us, they become their target. They would like to say, I didn't do anything. It must be in the hospital something happened. So most hospitals have what we call as body map. As soon as the child comes, the nurses are supposed to look at the child from top, bottom, every side of the child, and they record it. So there can't be any argument uh, about it, but yes, we do, and that's when we report to the state, and they come out, and they interview the child. Some children, they cannot sleep, because their mind is still racing about what they have seen dad doing to the mother, or mother doing to the dad. By the way, I want to make clear here I have a friend who is the, uh, in charge of the domestic violence program in Newcastle County, a lawyer. She tells me there are some days when the cases are equal, meaning equal number of men complaining that women are abusing them. We commonly think and say that it is men physically abusing the women, but the other side is also true. I just uh, ran into a family where the grandmother killed her husband and for her good fortune she was released because of passion killing as the judge 40 years back called it. So just to, to make aware of that, uh, and if I go into the dynamics of it, men tend to be reactive quickly and women they sort of pastor. So the women should be careful not to let the 
discussion or argument continue because husbands or men they think more in black and white women can deal with gray area all the time it's all clearly written in that book men from mars and women from venus seriously and that is the difference so if women learn that that they should the way they say it they may even be saying in low tone but they are saying you stink i mean that is the message to the husband and the husband is reactive he is going to take some action same way the husbands need to learn that the time that a woman takes to come back is much longer than it is for men meaning they are going to stay mad for a period of time so if you keep asking her what's wrong with you why don't you talk with me it's not going to go anywhere so this is a negotiation between the spouses that over the years hopefully they learn 42 years i'm still learning okay then sleep problems i said in nightmares some children depending upon their sensitivity they in their mind at nights may have those scenes of domestic violence or their abuse or their brother's abuse and their minds cannot calm down there are times particularly those kids who come to us in the hospital obviously they come to the hospital when the situation is worst we have to use some medications to help them okay still more of the now this is the child who has been abused and very clearly this is how much anger this child has sometimes they totally shut down this is how the human minds work it, it reminds me when my children were applying for college and they said they are asking for a story something to write and they say there is nothing dad in our life that we can write about it's dull boring the how it has been in a way i said son you should be thankful to god because you got the closest to the normal possible but when things don't happen in the normal routine fashion meaning now you talk about the physical abuse you talk about the spousal abuse the domestic violence then the minds go this way either they go to this extreme or they go to this extreme meaning either the child shuts down or the child becomes this way um the kids become moody they cannot trust the adults i'll show you another slide where th the dilemma of that particular issue becomes more clear they they become aggressive towards other children towards the family members in the neighborhood and sexual acting out mostly we see the girls but there are some boys too and then cruelty to animals they can't take their anger out anywhere so they take it out on the the family pets i mean i have horror stories uh, of the children who have come to me uh, in the hospital setting what they have done to little kittens and dogs and all that and then fire setting behavior this is another way for a child to show their anger there is a triangle we call in our field which is fire setting cruelty to animals and bed wetting if a child has all three of them chances of this child later on becoming a conduct disorder or as an adult and antisocial personality is very very high and there can be some other changes uh, depending upon the child okay who abuses children these are the people who are really supposed to take care of a child that is the irony these are the family members the daycare workers the babysitters the scout leaders or coaches that infamous uh, penn state issue and then the teachers and people in the church neighbors and strangers it is almost in the same sequence the commonest one is within the family the people who the child knows and trusts common scenario is 
that a woman gets remarried and she, the way she trusts her new husband, she thinks that she can trust her children the same way to him. And it may not be the case. There is a lot of temptation. She should be careful. Actually, there may be... Uh, th definitely there are families where everything works out fine. But yes, there are situations. And the, where I get involved, what, what I find is that the child may have been abused for years. And the mother is working uh, or it is happening at night time and the child had very hard time speaking up, a lot of hesitation. And ultimately at some point something happens, a crisis situation takes place and school child may tell someone. So in any case, the point here is that unfortunately the same people that the child has at times evil ones out of them or when shaitan takes over them this is what, what happens they start abusing now here if you see there are it's a classroom setting and the teacher is pulling this child's ears uh, you may find it interesting uh, that half of the states here in the u.s still allow corporal punishment bodily punishment to the children in our country I remember a family that I was dealing with and I was telling the father that how, why the state was involved and he said, well, Dr. Khan, if I was still, we were living where, where we came from, it would not be a big issue. I said, tell me. He said, well, I came from a small village in Alabama and no one cared about it. We had not even heard that this is something like that. So from part of uh, different parts of the country, may be their knowledge level or information is very different and they may be dealing with things very differently. I'm not supporting that, but I'm just, same way uh, another example comes to my mind is that the child was clearly hyperactive. These children tend to be more in trouble. And the, when the woman came to me, she was from one part of uh, Africa, uh, she said, I figure it out, what I'm going to do. Don't worry about the medication. I don't want the medication. I don't want the pill to, for my child. That's commonly I hear. Oh, so what are you going to do? I'm going to just buy a ticket and send him back to Liberia. Oh, what would happen there? He will find out. He thinks he's a big shot, seven-year-old kid. He said, That's what I did to my older son. He's behaving now. So he was being using the normal, usual criteria. He was being physically abused there by relatives, by teachers, everyone. And uh, so that's what I mean, the cultural issues. Okay. Recognizing child abuse. Sometimes when a sympathetic adult, like when children come to us, our nurses, social workers, myself, when we talk to the child, this is the answer. This is the response. Child is not saying anything. So suspicion level, red flag goes up. Now, sometimes it would happen that the child may inform, meaning a child may tell the mother that uh, stepdad is abusing me when you are away at work. She may not accept it, but repeatedly, then she may start realizing it. And child, this is more common in my experience, the children mostly tell it to the school authorities that before they would even tell to their own parents. An adult finds bruises on the child anywhere, in church, Boy Scouts, camps, hospital, and a physician may get concerned on routine physical examination. They may find something is wrong somewhere, either the way the child looks or in their examination some bruises or some old uh, scars or burn marks, whatever it is. And the child may have sexual acting out behavior at the age uh, when you're not even expecting uh, a child to know about sex. And here they're talking all the lingo and uh, even trying some things on other children. So obviously it raises suspicion. The first thing we obviously ask the caregivers, has this child been abused? Um, 
child's aggressive behavior, uh, we talked about it earlier, can also be suggestive. And writings and drawings. And in school and in, in a hospital setting, the creative art therapy people, sometimes they will stop me and they say, Dr. Khan, could you look at this drawing? I'm really suspicious. Repeatedly, this child is drawing the same thing which suggests this child has been either physically or sexually abused. And sudden change in the mood and behavior. And we may, by getting the uh, detailed history, may find out that when the parents uh, are saying the, these changes occurred, around the same time, this uh, mom had this new boyfriend who has started visiting or who actually moved in. And the child is not talking, but uh, th there are changes in the behavior. And same way, sleep disturbance or nightmares. So we talked about earlier a little bit. And these are the factors which increase the possibility of child as well as spousal or relationship between the two adults uh, uh, or domestic violence. Uh, very obvious, alcohol abuse, as you see some alcohol and the drugs and the needles there, drug abuse, conflict between the adults, and this, they may or may not be spouses or dysfunctional families, where there may be any combination of issues. Uh, they, there may be unemployment, which causes the stress, or it may be that one person is having an affair and neglecting the family or an actual abuse going on and the children are exposed to that and are victims of that and then serious medical problem. Let's suppose a child is autistic or a child has diabetes, needs to be taken care of, maybe his sugar needs to be tested four or five times and calories have to be counted or a child has frequent asthma attacks or epilepsy and that puts pressure on the adults, and the, no question about that. And sometimes I tell the family uh, of that nature, I said, you know, if this child was normal, you are an average or maybe a little bit above average as a parent, but the needs of this child is this high, and you are here, that's the issue. First, accept it that it is a challenge for you. God has given this child. And then calmly and cooperatively and together. Togetherness of the husband and wife. I cannot more emphasize on that. Some people who know me as a community service for the last 15 years, I have been doing weddings. I perform nikah. And those are the kind of things I teach to those people. That with my 40 some years of marriage and professional experience, this is what I have learned, that the togetherness of the husband and wife, what it creates in the family, there is no substitute for it. Having that thinking, when families come to me, the other day, an adopted child was brought to me, and the child is acting out. I still have to see a child who did not have some issues related to adoption. They may not speak it. This child started telling me she was describing her biological family in other part of the world. And she was only less than two years old when she was adopted. When I asked the parents, they had no idea. And the child, I helped them understand that this child is fantasizing when you yell at him, she fantasizes that the mother, real mother, was the greatest mother. And that father was the best father. And ultimately, this woman who was a professional woman, she said, Dr. Khan, I have done all my homework in this and I found the best place for my child. So what is that best place? It's University of Pittsburgh. What is best about it? Well, I counted. They have 10 things. They have occupational therapy, they have speech therapy, they have education went on and on, and I'm listening to her. I said, but your child does not need all of those. No, but you know, that makes it a good program. I came close to the woman. I said, mom, I know the best place. 
You want to hear? She says, yeah, tell me. I said, it's right here, in your lap. Mm -hmm. When I told that to my nurses, she said, Dr. Khan, did that woman start crying? I said, no, and that is the problem. She has become callous. And that girl talks about it. Repeatedly coming to the hospital, and this is what was the bottom of it. That mother does not listen, she does not care about me. On small little things, she yells, screams. This is also very common, it happens. People adopt children as if they are pets. They are human beings. They have the same emotions. And if, as long as they are behaving, they are fine, parents are fine. The moment they even are going through normal challenges of a teenager, whatever, or more so if they have some issue, some medical disease, some learning disability, ADHD, and the parents have to put five times more extra energy, they, they started distancing themselves from that child. Those are the kind of children that we deal with, and unfortunately, ultimately, they end up in foster homes, group homes, residential treatment centers, long-term places. And I spend a lot of my time with parents on that issue. That please, please understand, there is no better place for the child than the, ch the family. And you have it. You can do it. You have done it before. Some of them listen to me, and I start by saying with my experience, I say, I'm going to tell you a few things. Half of the parents listen to me, half don't. So I will understand if you don't take my advice. But you are asking me, Dr. Khan, you are the expert, give us the advice. Well, then listen to it. Okay. Now, uh, I just want to make sure that this is how it works. If you are a school teacher, even if you are in a church or masjid, and the, the word I want to emphasize here is because it's a federal law that if you suspect, it's not that you are getting everyone into trouble, but if you have good reasons to suspect that, and I, we already enumerated how we suspect a child may have been being abused, then it is your duty to inform the state authorities. I have never heard anyone getting into trouble because they did not inform, but it is certainly a federal law that teachers, church people, masjid people, uh, scout leaders, coaches, if they suspect, again, the government is emphasizing, you don't have to prove. Like, you may be afraid that someone will come and investigate you and say, you tell me, why did you call and said, I'm suspecting? No, you don't have to. You give the reasons why you had called, fine. But, not calling is illegal, and then it is the duty of the state authorities, because they are trained to interview the child and go to home, inspect the home, and then find out uh, if the child abuse is already taking place. Some 30 years back, when I was dealing in a hospital, and this Afro-American child was admitted, and the nurses saw that the child was afraid of being with the parents. And these they were all white crowd. Their right away, their response was, oh, let me call the child abuse hotline. Because the child was saying, I don't want to be close to my parents. And I said, well, let me at least talk to this child and then figure out what's going on. When I child talked to this child, this child was talking about devil and the angels and people putting poison in his food and that he saw snakes in the school and all that. When I got the family in, I found out that there were two, three family members in the extended family who had same schizophrenia. So we started treating this child with medication and he got better and better. And that gave me an opportunity to talk to my staff that don't take everything on face value right away. Take your time, and uh, I'm being honest here, they assumed that this Afro-American kid doesn't want to be with the family, it must be abuse. Turned out to be they were the best parents, 
and they were at their wits ends and that's why they brought their child to our hospital okay all right now this is you know when kids end up in emergency rooms or other medical facilities and if they suspect that there is some abuse these are some of the things which are done the very first one for all kinds of reasons as a physician i'm going to i'm telling you it's not done as thoroughly as it should be done i often tell my nurses they would be wasting 3 4 days they would be saying to me oh dr khan we couldn't get the child started on the medication because we couldn't get the consent in psychiatric hospital everything medication that goes on we have to have the consent uh, why couldn't oh over the telephone number doesn't work and repeatedly i say my best source is child himself this is how i child was with me i wanted to talk to mom i as i these days you know everyone has a cell phone i asked the child i dialed it and talked to the mom and obviously we need to check from the caretakers i do all kinds of things to do that i go out of the way to meet with parents sitting here with you guys i'm getting a little anxious because in an hour hour and a half there would be visits in my hospital i like to be there and interact with the parents valuable valuable you i mean it's unbelievable how valuable it is and then examination by a nurse our nurses do that i, I said earlier body map and as uh, sometimes physicians medical physician we have a medical consultant come to our hospital every day they examine the child and if needed the x rays are done you see one picture of the x ray it is showing new and the old fractures of the ribs and sometimes mri can get give us more information and the other necessary tests sometimes i will ask for hiv hepatitis series chlamydia gonorrhea for girls and we find some of them are positive and then it gives us chance to talk to them because they cannot deny now uh, and then how we can find out how the abuse was taking place okay see this child what you said earlier this child is acting out what he has seen the spousal in the domestic violence I, i have treated those children who said because for months and months sometimes for years their mind cannot stop racing on that scene that they saw mom's boyfriend or my husband this way doing to the mother so now on the school this is how it starts school is saying to the school counselor this child has a toy gun which he was not supposed to bring but this is what he's doing to the other children so one thing leads to the other the school counselor cannot deal fully well they more so they put bandaid on it and they do a good job for the most part and then they for example contact us either in the office or depending upon the child's behavior to our hospital and then we go into lengths and we find out this child is drawing the same things he is doing the same thing to the other children in the hospital and then we find out what is the real story these children can have all kinds of these problems being defined in conduct disorder meaning stealing and uh, uh, being rough to others their moods and their the depression anxiety separation anxiety is quite common with those children quite often i ask a child who is not going to school which is school phobia uh, are you worried something will happen bad to you or your family quite often it is the mother they worry about their mother that if they go to school something bad will happen to mother because they have seen bad thing happening to mothers so they don't want to go to school so again things start from the school this child or parents may tell to the school guide and come this child whatever i do i come myself i don't let him go bus but the child doesn't want to come to school and then they sometimes because of their moods changes they may get diagnosed as bipolar disorder stress reaction and also not uncommon uh, post traumatic stress disorder it's a technical term which is means is that the child has been traumatized for whatever reasons domestic violence they have seen or they have been abused themselves 
and later on they have sleep problems, they have nightmares and these things they do not let their mind rest and sometimes they may need years of uh, counseling for that. Now this is uh, Brother Freed what you had asked uh, how these families and these children can be uh, helped. Obviously the best support that comes is from the family. More stable a family more they can provide support to the child. I mean, a child, unfortunately, may have been abused somewhere by a stranger. And if the family has provided an environment where the child feels open to talk about it, and that's when the healing process starts. And then they can contact the school and see if the school guidance counselor or some other authorities within the school have the ability, time, and energy uh, and expertise to do that. And there are self-esteem building, there are some even uh, assignments that the children are done in our hospital, they quite often do that. Because as I mentioned earlier, the first thing that affects the children who are being abused is their self-esteem, that they don't count anything, people can walk over them. And then the perf if nothing is working, uh, that way I think that the um, the massages can play a role and uh, but necessary thing is really uh, proper training uh, there is an institute in uh, Washington DC family uh, uh, support and violence something like that um, my daughter-in-law just told me they are visiting us today uh, she's involved in that it's started primarily by lawyers and actually she was asking me to ask here, uh, they, they do that job free, community service, they will come out and actually train the imams how to recognize these things and uh, help people who are going through domestic violence issues. And obviously there, there are some support groups, uh, like in our area there is a Child Inc. name of the uh, agency, I'm not sure if it is national or not. Uh, and they can all run these, they run those groups. Uh, in our own organization, Delaware Guidance Services, we provide that from time to time. And then we have trained therapists who children can go to and get help. Uh, and yes, it is true that there are very few Muslims who provide some services, particularly to the Muslim community. And there are situations, both in office as well as in hospitals, more so in hospitals where psychotropic, psychotropic means these medications which affect the mind. These are for depression, anxiety, ADHD, bipolar disorder kind of things which I have the expertise and all the time in hospital children uh, we, we have to use them. And the last one is there is a very specific trauma focused treatment and more and more therapists are getting training for that and they work very intensively with those children with all kinds of techniques to, to help them put all that uh, trauma and violence that they have witnessed in spouses or other relationships or they have been abused themselves, uh, how to uh, put them in perspective enough so that uh, it does not keep interfering with their lives. There is a young, not so young now, in 50s, a woman who was once uh, uh, Miss America and now she has an institute of sexual abuse in um, Denver, Colorado and it started in that Catholic family, white people, a very high level executive, dad being a vice president, uh, for 10 years the girl was regularly being abused sexually by the father. And she said that I told my mom, mom would not agree, would not accept that this is happening. So she was closing her eyes and she said, then I got older uh, and older I got more, I put my energy towards my education and she was always valedictorian in school, then in college. And then she got married and she said, I found a very supportive young man who knew all this and dealt with it with her properly and then they together created this uh, and she said that one day I decided I must tell my dad. She, was, she said he was on the phone 
and then as we were talking and he never heard me say that way and he said okay wait a minute I'll talk to you later and he said oh, I, I still was on the phone he came back and he talked to me more and he said after that he would not say anything and he said I had some gut feeling what's going on the other side and he said I right away rushed in my car and my suspicion was correct the guy had shot himself he couldn't understand couldn't deal with the idea that now other people will find out because that was a secret in particularly somewhat in physical abuse but much much more so in sexual abuse cases there are secrets in the family this is what I tell my families that you prepare a document yourself under these subheadings number one list of problems of my child whatever it may be school home sleep mood whatever and give some details how long it was some examples don't have hundred pages but do write that it is not uncommon for me to get anywhere from 15 to 18 complaints then we condense them number two childhood history going back to mom's pregnancy and delivery and year by year if anything happened that may have shaken up the child common examples being death divorce separation moving from one place to another domestic violence those kind of issues third family history extremely important which is depression anxiety bipolar disorder ADHD schizophrenia alcoholism drugs even